This is Nate Harrison, recording in winter of 2004. I'd like to talk about drums, or rather, about a particular drum beat. I'm sure you've heard it dozens of times before. It's a ubiquitous piece of the pop culture soundscape. It's been used as a rhythmic backdrop in everything from late 80s gangster rap to corporate America's recycling hip-hop forms to sell things like Jeeps and blue jeans to suburban America. In fact, just last week, I saw a TV commercial for a pharmaceutical company where this drum beat was used to promote some sort of purple pill. It's been used so much, I might argue it's now entered into the collective audio unconscious and did so about three or four years ago. It's been somewhat glossed over now, but it has quite a history to it. This particular drum beat, or rather this break beat, as it is more accurately called, or even more simply just break, well, this particular break is called the Amen, the Amen break. Here's what it sounds like. Here, I'll play it again. Now this break, despite its popularity and use over the last decade or so in contemporary culture, dates back almost 40 years. The Amen Break is a small piece of, and gets its name from, a song released in 1969 titled Amen Brother. Amen Brother was recorded by a funk and soul band who called themselves the Winstons. Amen Brother is the B-side of a single released by the Winstons titled Color Him Father. Color Him Father went on to win a Grammy Award for the band, becoming one of the top 100 hits of 1969. It's probably the track for which the band is best known. However, it's the B-side, Amen Brother, that has that classic drum breakdown right in the middle of the song, which makes it perfect for sampling. Here it is again, with more of the rest of the track included to give it context. So, Amen Brother was recorded, it was released, it was played, it came and went. Nothing terribly remarkable about it. However, the drum loop in the middle of the song was resuscitated with the advent of the sampler in the 1980s. Just a brief aside about the sampler, this was a machine about the size of a VCR that allowed its user to record any sound into it for quick playback and arrangement. The sampler, as well as the turntable, were principal tools largely responsible for the birth and development of hip-hop. With a sampler, any drum beat, any guitar riff, any sound that could be recorded could be used as part of a new composition, a new contextualization. Nowadays, almost all commercially produced music has been at least in part realized with a sampler. But hip-hop and other electronic-based music genres pioneered the creative use of samplers, and the Amen Break was one of the first drum samples to be experimented with. Here's an early example, the track Words of Wisdom by New York duo Third Bass released in 1989. And here's another example, NWA's track, Straight Outta Compton, also from 1989. Straight Outta Compton, crazy motherfucker named Ice Cube, from the gang called Niggas with Finally, here is Mantronics with King of the Beats from 1990. In these cases, a one-bar loop of the Amen was used to create the rhythms. That is to say, it's a fairly straightforward use of the break. As time went on and samplers became more complex, so did their usage. In the UK, right around the time Straight Outta Compton is released, the rave scene there explodes, with musicians and DJs who used samplers in the Amen break to produce hardcore techno, raga jungle, and drum and bass. Jungle in particular, it being an amalgamation of reggae toasting, heavy bass lines, and high-speed breakbeats, centers its aesthetic almost entirely around the deconstruction of the Amen. 
This was done by slicing the original six-second sample into its individual drum hits. Each snare drum, each bass drum, the hi-hats, the crash cymbal. The slices could then be rearranged and manipulated in any number of ways to create new patterns. Here's an earlier jungle artist. This is Shy FX's track, Original Nata, from 1994. And here's another by L Double and Younghead, titled New Style, from 1996. Amen tracks like these were plentiful and easily disseminated to their audiences via acetate test pressings, or dub plates as they're called. These one-off recordings, unlike mass-produced vinyl records that typically had to be pressed in quantities of 1,000 or more, were, and still are, cheap to make and could be cut quickly. A musician could make an Amen track in the morning, get a dub plate cut that afternoon, and have a DJ play it to a crowd that night. Dub plates don't last very long, however and can only be played about 50 times before they wear out. The recording you are listening to now is an example of a dub plate. In any event, with Jungle's popularity, what you got in reaction was this sort of chin-stroking art crowd who took the Amen as their own in the name of a sort of, as some might say, a highbrow posturing. They proceeded to push the levels of absurdity with its use, really tweaking the arrangements beyond a point of danceability and syncopation and into a realm of pure fetishization and self-indulgence. Here's the UK's Tom Jenkinson, aka Square Pusher, with the track Vic Acid from 1997. And the US's Keith Whitman, aka Havratsky, with his track, Routine Exercise, from 1998. And now, just to fast forward a bit, if you tune in to the internet radio station www.ragajungle.com, you'll be massaged by endless permutations of the Amen break, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Despite Jungle and Drum and Bass being over 10 years old now, they still have their hardcore fans, even if they base their devotion partly on the nostalgia of the early UK scene. I find this quite interesting. Hundreds of tracks, dozens of DJs, a number of clubs and events, in effect an entire subculture, based on this one drum loop. I mean, based on six seconds from 1969. What is it about the Amen break? What's the fascination? Is it the punch of the snare drum? Or maybe the overall groove of the loop? Obviously it seems to have infected a great many musicians. Here's one more example, and a kind of odd one at that. Perry Farrell, as some know as the frontman for Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros, making some kind of hybrid rock jungle cover of Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love. The original Whole Lot of Love, ironically enough, was released by Led Zeppelin in 1969, the same year Amen Brother was released. Indeed, the Amen break appears quite adaptable to a range of music genres and tastes. So perhaps an important question is, where are the Winstons during all this? Sample-based music both in the U.S. and abroad mushroomed during the 1990s. Were they around to witness the transformation of their breakbeat from a baby boomer soul groove into a staple for underground electronic music? Did any of the members of the band care about its blatant appropriation, seemingly without consent, by musicians in rave and hip-hop? 
perhaps Richard Spencer, a founding member of the Winstons and the copyright holder of Amen Brother, and who interestingly enough left the music biz and later received a PhD in political science, simply didn't care. Perhaps he, like many people during hip-hop's early years, didn't see it and other sample-based music as having any potential beyond a limited underground appeal. During the 80s, when DJs plundered old jazz and R&B records looking for samples, hip-hop in particular and electronic music in general were not the pop phenomena and money makers we know them as today. There seemed to be a brief few sort of glory years back then, when the novelty of sampling and the rate at which it was being employed as a new technique grew faster than the rate at which any sort of copyright bureaucracy could maintain the law. Older bits of sampling were appropriated, perhaps under the assumption of their being able to be freely used, in the spirit of a pledge to new forms. In other words, sampling was not seen as merely rehashing past sounds, but as an attempt to make new from something old, an artistic strategy as time-honored as creative expression itself. Only when these urban forms began receiving a lot of attention and making a lot of money did people, and more importantly, corporate bigwigs who held the copyrights to much of the back catalog of contemporary American music, start cracking down on copyright violation. Remarkably, though, the Winstons, who, by the way, do still exist today, although in name only as none of the original members play in the band any longer, never pursued legal action against those hundreds of instances of the Amen Breaks appropriation over the last 20 years. It seemed the Amen, by the sheer amount of its use by producers and DJs around the world, had entered into a type of public domain, if not legally, then certainly culturally. At any rate, during Jungle's transformation from an underground club status to a more user-friendly electronica, as the media likes to call it, a curious chain of events happened. Advertising agencies, always looking for new angles to help peddle consumer products by tapping into what the kids on the margins are listening to these days, started using breakbeats, including the Amen, in television commercials. For example, here's a Jeep ad running in Southern California right now, promoting their extreme Jeep snow event. Nothing handles the winter elements like a Jeep 4x4, except, of course, you. Now, during the Extreme Jeep Snow event, visit your Jeep dealer and get a lift pass to Sugar Bowl, Bear Mountain, or Snow Summit. You'll also get a chance to win a legendary Grand Cherokee. And now, California buyers get zero plus on Grand Cherokee. Now, noticing a rise in popularity in breakbeat music and recognizing a growing market of commercial producers wishing to use the Amen break, third-party companies started selling it through what seemed to be completely legal channels. For example, at the end of the 1990s, a UK company by the name of Zero G Limited started selling jungle construction kits, sample CDs containing hundreds of breakbeats, including the Amen. Here is their version of it from their Jungle Warfare sample CD, which, by the way, is copyrighted 2002 by Zero G. And here is the original Amen break again, taken from the actual Winston's vinyl release I bought off eBay, copyrighted 1969. I sped the break up slightly to match a jungle tempo. I don't think it's much of a stretch to conclude that Zero G appropriated the Amen, although according to their packaging they guarantee that all samples in the construction kit have been created specially for it. Likewise, nowhere in their literature does it mention any licensing of the Amen from the Winstons. So, here we have two copyrights of the same material. How can this be? Furthermore, while I can use Zero G's version of the Amen to make and sell music, I don't own the Amen sample I bought from them. I only own a license from them to use it. I cannot take their Amen and make and sell my own sample CD kit. Thus, in some ways, the Amen belongs less now to the Winstons, and more to companies like Zero G Limited. Why do I bring any of this up? What is significant about the Amen break? I'm talking about it here because I think its story is a good example illustrating the rise and subsequent problematic of digital sampling in relation to today's increasingly stringent copyright and trademark laws. To trace the history of the Amen break is to trace the history of a brief period of time when it seemed digital tools offered a potentially unlimited amount of new forms of expression. 
where cultural production, at least musically, was full of possibilities by virtue of being able to freely appropriate from the musical past, to make new combinations and thus new meanings. The story demonstrates that a society, quote, free to borrow and build upon the past, is culturally richer than a controlled one, unquote. To use the words of Lawrence Lessig, Stanford Law Professor, Copyright Reform Advocate, and co-founder of Creative Commons, an organization offering a legal alternative to copyright control. As we go forward, examples like the Amen break will become more and more rare, if non-existent. A Sixth Circuit Federal Appeals Court ruled in September of this year that recording artists must pay for every sample they use not in the public domain, regardless of the length or recognizability of the samples in question. But because of various changes to U.S. copyright laws, for example the Copyright Act of 1976 and the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act of 1998, which extend copyrights into the mid-21st century, virtually all 20th century cultural output has been locked away from the public domain, barred from sampling, unless one has deep pockets and expensive lawyers. So it seems a company like Zero G, with its attempt at regulating the use of, and profiting from, the use of the Amen break, is helping to secure the supremacy of copyright laws, while the company's very success itself occurred because of a lack of strict copyright control surrounding breakbeat sampling. In other words, not only does the innovation within culture grow when copyright is flexible, so do its markets and capital. New trends are developed, new sounds are sought after. New releases are anticipated and become hugely popular, perhaps even selling out. New stars are born and new fan bases are created. Money is exchanged, all in the pursuit of new forms and experiences, of potentials for new connections and meanings. I think the history of the use of the Amen break demonstrates this. To cite Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Alex Kaczynski in a copyright ruling last year, quote, Overprotecting intellectual property is as harmful as underprotecting it. Culture is impossible without a rich public domain. Nothing today, like nothing since we tamed fire, is genuinely new. Culture, like science and technology, grows by accretion, each new creator building on the works of those who came before. Overprotection stifles the very creative forces it's supposed to nurture." Unquote. End of recording.